The Buffalo Bills bounce back and win on Monday Night Football, and they had to beat the Jets and the refs to do it. That and more on today's edition of Locked On NFL. The new Locked On NFL. The madman Tyler Rowland is your double shot of NFL espresso. With the Locked On local experts on every major story. Get ready, Roland is revving up. The new Locked On NFL starts now. Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Football fans, welcome into the Locked On NFL Podcast, bringing you a double dose of the NFL's biggest stories with help from our local experts that know your favorite teams like no one else. I am your host, the madman, Tyler Rowland, joined today as I am every Tuesday by Locked On NFL expert Lauren Cox. On today's show, the Buccaneers fight back and inspire Tampa Bay. You cannot trust the Philadelphia Eagles. And of course, we start with the Buffalo Bills bouncing back on Monday Night Football against the Jets. Do want to thank you for making Locked On NFL your first listen of the day and for being an everydayer here with us at the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Lauren, I'm not going to bury the lead on this one. The Buffalo Bills beat the New York Jets 23-20 to on Monday Night Football. But the big story for me was the terrible officiating. I said it at the beginning of the show, and I absolutely mean it. It felt like the Bills had to beat the Jets and also beat the refs with the bad roughing the passer call with some of the ticky-tack pass interference stuff going on. It was really unbelievable to see the amount of penalties that were called in this game. Well, it was 11 penalties for each team. And, and I'm left Ooh. feeling like, you know, if, if I'm the, if I'm a Jets fan, when the Jets are trying to drive down at the end to win the game, holding penalty here, or passing, you know, pe- an eligible receiver downfield here, like the pe- referees kept getting in the Jets way a little bit to it. And by the end, it felt more like a Thursday night football game than a Monday night right. football. Well, I think another thing that added to the beautiful disaster of a game that it was, was the kicking. We saw missed kicks on both sides, extra point for the Bills, a kick. We got a couple doinks from the Jets kicker, Greg Zerlin. I mean, it was madness out there. And although the referees and the penalties and all that made for a bit, of, a little bit of a, a, a choppy flow to the game, I do still think it was an incredibly entertaining game. And we saw both offenses really do some great stuff. The Bills ran for 149 yards. The Jets got 121 yards of their own. We got a magical Aaron Rodgers, Hail Mary, vintage Aaron Rodgers, Hail Mary there. Josh Allen on that final touchdown pass of the game for him, swooping underneath the defensive lineman. I mean, both of these teams were entertaining in this game, even with all the craziness happening. Yeah, it's it's amazing how... The Jets fire their defensive head coach, and then the defense <laughs> drops off a little bit, but the offense figures things out when you take Nathaniel Hackett out of the play calling, so it kind of balances out one way or another. One of the big differences we saw, I, I don't remember, who, I think it was Ben Solak from ESPN tweeted out, the rate of pre-snap motion for the Jets shot way up. It's something Aaron Rodgers had fought about for a long time, but I think it helped them get guys going in the passing game. Lazard having a huge game, Garrett Wilson as well. Like Those guys were on the same page, and you get them some of that head start moving pre-snap and getting them early read on the coverage and maybe just maybe that's what started getting things going for the Jets but obviously not enough to to keep up with the Bills in this one yeah honestly I think the Jets are lucky to be as close in that game as they were I mean Buffalo missed the extra point miss a field goals and then you the Hail Mary as well which you know Aaron Rodgers is the best in NFL history at that but still there's luck involved with the Hail Mary I, I when you're talking about the motion rates, which is a great thing to point out with Todd Downing taking over as the offensive coordinator, to me it reminds me of the grandpa meme where you got the grandpa with the walker and Todd Downing's like, Aaron, we need to run more motion. And Aaron's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, let's get you to bed, grandpa. You know, like we need to modernize this offense and do some of these things. But spinning it forward and looking kind of at the long view here coming out of this game, the Buffalo Bills absolutely had to have this game. They had lost their previous two games. They lose to the Ravens. They lose to the Texans, who, you know, I think are two really, really good football teams. But at the end of the day, the Bills expect to be on the same level as those teams. So this win doesn't, you know, erase that entirely. But Buffalo could not drop three in a row after the way that they looked at the beginning of the season. So getting this win now, they get the Titans at home next week. Buffalo is going to be just fine. And 
they had to fight, you know, tooth and nail to get this one, but they needed it desperately. It's kind of hard to believe that a game this ugly was for first place in the AFC East at this <laughs> stage of the process. Like, I, it didn't feel like either of these teams played like first place team that's going to win the division and try and get a first round by. And yet, I think I think for Buffalo, you could feel like, okay, they scraped out a tough one and can still play a lot better and are still getting big division wins like this and overcoming the Jets having their post-firing mm-hmm. boost. Like, okay, you withstood maybe the Jets' best punch at you all season, and you're going to be fine moving forward. Well, you make a great point there. You get that post-firing head coach boost that teams typically get. And the Jets still, at home in primetime, weren't able to get over that hill with such an opportunity in front of them. And it creates a lot of questions. And my guy, John B. from Locked On Jets, talked about exactly that. The Jets fall to the Bills on Monday Night Football, and they have only themselves to blame. I'm John, the host of Locked On Jets, and the New York Jets are now 2-4 and four after a 23-20 loss to the Buffalo Bills at MetLife Stadium on Monday Night Football. The Jets had many opportunities to win this game, but they could not take advantage. The Bills played a very sloppy game. They gave the Jets every opportunity to get the victory. However, the Jets failed time and again. The key sequence of this game came in the second half. Twice, the Jets had the ball inside the Buffalo five-yard line. They scored a combined three points on those drives, failing to punch in touchdowns, and Greg Zerline missed a short kick. At two and four, the Jets face a very long road back. I think any talk of Devontae Adams should end. If anything, the Jets might want to consider being sellers at the trade deadline. For more on the Jets, tune in to the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I just got to say, I I love my guy, John, but I disagree entirely. And a lot of it has to do with the New York Jets schedule. They play against the Steelers next week. And the Steelers are a good team. We're going to talk about them here in a second. But the Steelers aren't unbeatable for the Jets. And after that, they get the Patriots. That's absolutely a game the Jets win. And then they play the Texans. That's probably going to be a loss for the Jets. The Texans are a great team. But then Cardinals, Colts, Seahawks. Dolphins, Jaguars, Rams, and then they play the Bills again and then finish with the Dolphins. I mean, there's no reason that the Jets can't reel off seven or eight wins in a row with that schedule coming forward. So I would absolutely still be in the Devontae Adams conversation if I'm the Jets who can't give up on the season right now. I agree that I don't think they should, you know, wave the white flag and give up on the season just yet. But I don't know, is is Devontae Adams the cure to what the Jets need right now when, when you finally have... Alan Lazard having the big game connecting with Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson obviously has another big game. Like it didn't feel to me like the problem tonight was wide receivers necessarily like the Mm -hmm. offense, not that we could just assume, all right, it's fixed for the rest of the year, but like they made enough progress on that side of the ball that I'm not sure I'm so desperate to go, to go get Devonta Adams just yet. And maybe I look around and say, can I make this defense even a little bit better? Is there, is there more I can do to help this team rather than just get one of Aaron Rodgers' best buddies who will certainly help, but not like, I don't know that wide receiver it remains the biggest, biggest need, but it is still an area you could improve the team, I suppose. Well, one thing that I would say is the Jets were one and four in the red zone in this game, and the connection between Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, I think would probably help in, in that area of the matchup, but I think it's fair to wonder whether that would be enough to, to change things. But I think that at this point, they either need to sell or they need to buy all the way in. And looking at that schedule, I would buy all the way in. But speaking of a team that I'm not buying all the way in, the Philadelphia Eagles, they may have bounced back this week, but I do not think that you can trust them. We'll talk about that and some other bounce back teams from week six. It's Locked On NFL, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. NFL fans, yes, I'm talking to you. NFL fans, you could start the second quarter of the NFL season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, go over to FanDuel. You could check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same exact place where you do your bets. So it's all right there on the same page for you, an all-encompassing hub of football information on FanDuel. and. Right now, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. And if you're looking for something to place that $5 bet on, I'll just remind you that if you listen to FanDuel Friday with me and Ross Jackson, every single bet that I offered up on FanDuel Friday hit this weekend. So make sure that you go to America's number one sportsbook. It's FanDuel, and you can do it at FanDuel.com. 
Today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the best way to play daily fantasy sports. That's why they have over 10 million members and have awarded billions of dollars in winnings. Prize Picks makes daily fantasy sports accessible to all. All you have to do is pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Run your game all season long on prize picks. I personally love prize picks, again, because it's so, so easy. Justin Jefferson, 83 and a half receiving yards. Patrick Mahomes, 250 and a half passing yards. Tyreek Hill, 90 and a half receiving yards. Saquon Barkley, 60 and a half rushing yards. Those are just examples, but all you do is pick a lineup of two to six players and say whether they're going to do more or less. Make sure you download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code Locked On NFL. You're going to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. That's the Prize Picks app. Use code Locked On NFL to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. It's Prize Picks. Run your game. All right, Lauren, let's continue today's edition of Locked On NFL. We talked about that fantastic Monday night fo football game, despite the choppiness of the referees and all of that. I still think it was a very, very entertaining football game. But shocker, I loved a football game. I don't think that's a big surprise <laughs> to anybody out there. But with that being said, the Bills aren't the only team that bounced back this week. And we got to talk about the Philadelphia Eagles, who had taken a bad loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 33-16. to They come back, they beat the Browns, 20-16. to And I'll tell you, Lauren, although the Eagles bounced back, I still do not trust this football team. And I think my guy Louie from Locked On Eagles feels the same. All right, the Eagles win it, 20-16, to but the same problems remain. They are a poorly coached football team. They had a bye week to prepare for one of the worst teams in the league, and they barely win by four points. But man, this is a talented roster. A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, two of the most clutch players in football. Huge plays in the fourth quarter to win this football game. Thank God they're back. I don't know. Maybe the talent this roster has is enough this year in such an up-and-down league. But overall, the main problems for long-term remain the same. Because of this win, I'm not going to really change my mind. But at 3-2, and two, feels a lot better than 2-3 and three for sure. The pass rush today is stepping up. Hats off to Brandon Graham. 200 games in, remains as clutch as he ever was. We'll see what happens next week, but typical Toxic Eagles. Go Birds. Toxic Eagles. I love that from Louie from Locked On Eagles. But, yeah, I think the reality is they only won this game because they have freaks. They, like... They are so top-heavy with some of the good players they have. A.J. Brown, 6 for 116 and a touchdown. Some insane catches. Devontae Smith makes a big 45-yard touchdown. Three catches, 64 yards, and a touchdown. Like, the Eagles only win these games because they have such great, like, top-level players. But I agree the coaching is so suspect. I don't care that they're a winning record team right now. I do not trust the Eagles whatsoever in any kind of big-game environment. Yeah, I'm with you there. That the, a four point win over the Browns is not something that inspires Jeez. any sort of significant confidence in this team. I mean, I, I do want to give them some benefit of the doubt. I mean, they're they're a young secondary, and the, a lot of their players are you know guys that are on rookie contracts that you think are still slowly kind of getting better and settling into their own of, of who they are in this league. Plus, you add in the veteran talent. Like, there's there's enough there to feel like I mean, they in that division they should be able to compete with a lot of the other teams that you don't trust in that division. That somebody has to win it. And somebody has to make the playoffs in that group. And I'm I'm not sure that I have a ton more confidence in the rest of that group. Even Washington, I still have my doubts about just how trustworthy they are. Even though Jaden Daniels is playing great, I, I'm curious how sustainable that's going to be for them either. What are your doubts with the Washington Commanders at this point? Because I feel very confident that the Commanders are the best team in that division. What do you think could be coming down the line that could maybe rattle that confidence? I feel like Washington hasn't really beaten anybody all that impressive. Giants, Bengals, Cardinals, Browns, okay. And yes, Jaden Daniels has been playing great, but over the course of a rookie season, defenses are going to adjust and the commanders are going to have to adjust back. And their offensive coordinator is a guy who has a pretty bad history of starting really hot just like this and then trailing off, whether it was with the Arizona Cardinals as head coach or back at Texas Tech as well. You can look year by year. They'll start 3-1, and 4-1, 5-1, 6-0, and, oh, and then they'll finish the year 
0 and 5, 1 and 4, 2 and 3, and, and have these big drop offs later in the year for the team. So it seems like they figure out something right away that the league has trouble adjusting to. And then once they adjust, there's not really that counter adjustment back. So I'm kind of waiting for the, the commanders to play some good teams or at least some good defenses like the Bears and the Steelers and the Titans on their schedule. And maybe things fall back down a little bit. And that, that division looks a little murkier. Mm, very, very interesting, Lauren. Well, let's stay in the Keystone State of Pennsylvania because the Pittsburgh Steelers bounced back in a major way on Sunday as well, dismantling the Las Vegas Raiders 30 to to 13, my guy Chris Carter from Locked On Steelers broke down the win. Chris Carter here from the Locked On Steelers podcast with your post game reaction to the Steelers beating the Raiders 32 to 13 in Las Vegas. It was the most confident looking win the Steelers had all season without a doubt. Najee Harris going off 14 carries for 106 yards and a touchdown. Justin Fields adding two rushing touchdowns himself. Though the Steelers didn't do too great in the air, the ground game was there and it was able to punish the Raiders as the game went on. But but also the defense dominant though they did give up an opening touchdown drive defense comes out and creates three turnovers looks dominant throughout tj watt forcing two fumbles both get recovered dante jackson also getting an interception also almost got another inter interception but this was the best the steelers have looked all season long the question is can they start to learn things from this moving forward also Justin Fields' legs, is that enough to keep away Russell Wilson's arm we'll talk about that on the locked on steelers podcast i'm your host chris carter tune in wherever you get podcasts I I personally understand that it's the Raiders. Like, we're, you know, the Raiders, I think at the end of the day, will end up in the bottom three of the NFL, despite them not being right there record wise. Right now, that train is going off the tracks fast. But I will continue to believe in the Steelers. And I don't mean as a playoff contender, but as a team that will make the playoffs. I think the Steelers finish with a winning record because at the end of the day, they're going to play Steelers football. And that's exactly what they did here. Win the turnover battle, three to nothing, 183 rushing yards as a team. That is Pittsburgh Steelers football. And I don't care whether it's Justin Fields or Russell Wilson, Mike Tomlin is going to be able to get them to do that. They're going to lose those ugly games like they lost against Dallas, but they're going to absolutely dismantle any team that isn't close to their level, like the Raiders. That's what Mike Tomlin guarantees for you. I believe in the Steelers way more than I believe in the Eagles when it comes to making the playoffs this year. I'm with you there in that every time you have a Mike Tomlin coach team, I, I think you're going to make the playoffs, but I'm, mm -hmm. I don't have faith in the Steelers as like first place in the AFC North as they stand right now. It just feels weird to me that like a team who we're still not sure who the better quarterback is going to be for them is the team that like we're supposed to have all this faith in. Like they had this great bounce back game. Chris said like the best they've looked all season against the Raiders and their quarterback had 145 passing yards in that game. Like that doesn't feel like big, sustainable, long-term success there. Like they're four and two right now. And I think Mike, uh, Mike Tomlin will keep them around a nine and eight team. So that leaves them, you know, five and six the rest of the way. And that feels about right. Like, okay, that's not a great team, but it's good enough to make the playoffs and maybe they switch quarterbacks. But I don't know. It feels like good, but not great. And that Baltimore and Cincinnati over time, in theory, should establish themselves a little bit farther ahead of Pittsburgh, at least in terms of the quality of team you trust in the playoffs. Lauren, I don't believe in the Steelers because of the quarterback. It's the Mike Tomlin magic defense run game, and they're going to have that, and they're going to be 5-2 and two next week, and we're all going to be asking ourselves, how is this happening? But it's happening once again, and Mike Tomlin keeps getting away with it. But again, more bounce back teams in week six. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers not only bounce back in their season, but they get off the mat and inspire the Tampa Bay region, which obviously has been hit hard with weather in recent weeks. So we're going to talk about them and the Indianapolis Colts who just keep on chugging along as well. It's Locked On NFL, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the best place to buy tickets, period. Why? Because they have the best features in the entire industry, and now they just got a brand new feature that makes Game Time even better. It's called Game Time Picks, and it makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. I bought football, basketball, baseball, concert tickets on Game Time, again, because they have great features. They also have 
a view from your seat. You literally get a panoramic view of what you're going to be looking at when you sit down. And if you toggle on the feature in the app, they're going to give you all in pricing. So the price that you see is the price that you pay at checkout. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time Picks. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NFL. For $20 off your first purchase, terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. All right, Lauren, let's cap off today's edition of Locked On NFL, recapping all of the action in week six. We talked about it on yesterday's show, breaking it down more today. The Bills bounce back. The keystone bounce back, as I like to call it, with the Eagles and the Steelers. But there are other teams that really bounced back and put themselves in a good position this week. Before we get into it, thank you for making Locked On NFL your first listen. Make sure that you get subscribed. Stay subscribed for year-round free NFL content all week long. Check out the afternoon edition of Locked On NFL with Tony Wiggins in the barbershop as well. But the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Had to leave Tampa Bay early because of Hurricane Milton. The state of Florida already got hit by Hurricane Helene. I mean, just hellacious weather for the state of Florida in recent weeks. And the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, unaffected, go into New Orleans and dominate 51-27. to Now, I say dominate, and I don't think that's fair, actually, because that game was crazy back and forth. Tons of scoring. Tampa Bay goes up way early, gets down again, and then absolutely throttles the Saints in the second half. And my guy, James Yarko from Locked on Bucks, talked about that turnaround. Three interceptions in the second quarter, but to open up the second half, that Godwin touchdown got things back to normal, and it really dialed Baker 100% back in. After that, The Buccaneers scored on three of their last four possessions, thanks in large part to the running game that we're going to talk about more in a little bit. But getting that lead back after such a disastrous quarter really galvanized the team as a whole. It was a huge bounce back after Mayfield had more interceptions in one quarter than he had all season coming into this game. He still finished with four touchdown passes, which is a season high this year. He had two in each half, and his touchdown to interception ratio dropped from five and a half to one to three to one, but that's still pretty good. You you can kind of look at that second quarter as an anomaly. See, I don't think it's fair to say the second quarter is an anomaly. I think they're two-faced Tampa. That's what I'm calling them. Like They bounce back from the 36 to 30 heartbreaker against Atlanta when they're leading in the fourth quarter and they just lose that game in overtime. But that's the up and down nature of Baker Mayfield. Like, that's what you're going to get from Tampa. So I think that Tampa, when they're hot, are one of the best teams in the NFL. But the inconsistency of the Buccaneers and Baker Mayfield, uh, it it makes Tampa Bay a team that I don't necessarily trust. It's something you got to live with with Baker for sure. And but I think of all the bounce back teams we're talking about today, this is the team I think I have the most confidence mm. faith in. But I don't okay. think that's going to be rewarded right away. I think things are going to get worse for Tampa before they get better because <laughs> the next four games are Ravens, Falcons, Chiefs, 49ers, and then Ooh. they get their bye week. That's going to be rough. But coming out of that bye week, they're, they're going to drop to second or third in the division, and and people sure. are going to be panicking about the Buccaneers. But you come out of that with Giants, Panthers, Raiders, Chargers, Cowboys, Panthers, Saints. And this, to me, is a team that could get hot at the end of the season with a pretty bad schedule and ride that Baker Mayfield heat into the playoffs and feel like this could be a team that's dangerous by year's end but are still going to go a little bit farther down the Baker coaster here before we get to the bottom, and then things are going to take off again. Well, it's funny because last year they were, you know, going up against the Eagles, and a lot of people had the Eagles to win that game, and and Tampa Bay came in there and got it done. So it could be a similar situation where because of the tough middle of the season that you described that they're about to go into, people could underrate them, and then they go into the playoffs and knock off somebody, maybe an NFC North team, because how many NFC North teams are going to get into the playoffs, man? Like, just absolutely crazy over there in the NFC North. But, yeah, I I could see what you mean by them getting hot with that sort of schedule at the end. Now, another team that I do want to mention here is the Indianapolis Colts. 
They lose to the Jacksonville Jaguars 37-34 to in an absolute shootout. Jacksonville is one of the worst teams in the NFL, and it's kind of a shocker that the Colts lost that game. But they bounce back on the road against the Tennessee Titans. The Titans were coming off a bye. The Titans were at home. The Titans have a good defense in front. The Colts' defense got absolutely shredded by the Jacksonville Jaguars, who have been pretty inept in most of their other games, generally speaking. But the Colts' defense, especially their pass defense, holds the Titans to only 95 passing yards. Now, that may have to do with Will Levis being right there with Deshaun Watson for the worst quarterback in the NFL this season. But you got to give credit where credit is due. And for the Colts to be down and then come back in the fourth quarter with a game-winning touchdown to Michael Pittman and win that game, they just deserve credit for keeping the ship afloat. They're now 3-3, three and three, I do believe, on the year. And the Colts are still in the thick of it in the AFC. So, got to give a lot of credit there for them bouncing back from a bad loss against the Jags and kind of turning that defense around against the Titans. They have some of that Baker Mayfield energy as a team, right? That sort of <laughs> inconsistency of where they can go up and down. I mean, you look right. at every game they've played this season, it's been a one-score game. And we think about those as, as kind of like coin flips in the NFL over the course of time right. that – just kind of balance out. You tend to win as about as many as you lose, and that's why they're 3-3 three and three right now. And so that, to me, feels like the kind of team they're going to be for the rest of the year, that when they play a bad team like the Jacksonville Jaguars, they're going to play down to that level of an opponent. And when they play a good team like you know, the Houston Texans in Week 1, the Green Bay Packers in Week 2, like they'll play up to the level of good opponents on their schedule, and those are going to end up being a lot of coin flip games where they'll lose to a bad team they shouldn't lose to, and they might beat a good team that they shouldn't beat, and that leaves them eight and nine, nine and eight at the end of the year and, and maybe enough to sneak in as a playoff team, but not a team that I like trust to make some serious noise in the postseason just yet. Yeah, and honestly, they're about to get worse because Anthony Richardson is coming back to play quarterback. So that makes it difficult for the Colts. But still, I agree the rest of the team, they're going to get healthier too. They've had a lot of injuries and things like that. So Michael Pittman going from having a broke back to game-winning touchdown against the Titans absolutely crazy stuff, but um, obviously I, I've been affected by that game and that outcome. So with that being said, <laughs> that is going to do it for today's edition of Locked On NFL. It was a bounce back week six. Hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure that you get subscribed. Stay subscribed. It's your team every day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Check out the afternoon edition of Locked On NFL with Tony Wiggins in the barbershop. Some great content over there from the OG, the barber himself. Uh, shout out to Tony. But uh, we're both going through it with our personal teams this year. So thank God for Locked On NFL. But that's going to do it for me, the madman, Tyler Rowland, your host, here with my co-host, Lauren Cox. And as I tell you guys, every single episode, stay safe out there. <laughs>